In this video, we will take a look at the properties of summations and products. Let's begin by taking a look at summations first. What you see in front of you is a very simple equation. All this equation tells us is that the sum of n variables w1, w2 all the way till wn is equal to 1. Now let me quickly or briefly give you the context here. This equation is let's say something which an investor who is constructing his portfolio will write down. The investor is planning to invest in n stocks. He doesn't really know at the moment how much he will invest in any given stock. At the moment he is denoting the actual amount invested in any given stock by a W where the subscript denotes the index or the label for any given stock. W1 therefore is the amount invested in stock 1, W2 the amount invested in stock 2 and so on. The investor is writing down this equation assuming that he has $1 in total to invest and therefore at any given point in time the sum of all the W's will be equal to 1. So this equation is like a constraint which the final values of W which he is trying to solve for should obey or respect at any given point in time. Now I can actually write down this equation in a more compact in a mathematically fancier way by using what we refer to as the summation operator. To do that I need to go from one term to the next of this summation and try and find out if there is some kind of template which each of these n terms in this summation always follow. So if I were to move from first term to the second to the third I see that every term contains a w and what is changing in every term is actually the subscript of w. It moves from 1, 2 and all the way till n. Therefore, I can write down the general term of this summation to be actually w subscript i where I can note that i moves from i is equal to 1 to 2 all the way till n. Every time i is being incremented by 1. Okay, So therefore, I can write down this left hand side of the summation to be the sum from i is equal to 1 to n and this sum is equal to 1. The left hand side, I will read it to be the sum from i is equal to 1 to i is equal to n of wi. i is the index of summation. It is a dummy variable. You could very well have chosen it as j, k, l, whatever you are comfortable with. Okay. Now, I can try out one more example. Let's say if I want to write down mathematically this constraint. The total allocation to the first five stocks should not exceed 50%. I can write this down mathematically as the sum from i is equal to 1 to 5 of wi, remember first 5 stocks, should not exceed. That means it's not an equality here, it's actually an inequality. So it should be less than or equal to 0 0.5. That's how you will write down this statement mathematically. Okay. What we did here was that we started with a mathematical equation and we encoded it in a more compact form, something like this. Alternatively, we might also be, let's say, at times doing the opposite and that is we might start with the summation and we may expand it out to get a more clear understanding of what needs to be done. So for example, if I were to take two limits of i, the lower limit p, upper limit q and I am putting this condition that lower limit is less than or equal to upper limit. So if I were to run a summation from i is equal to p not necessarily i is equal to 1 to i is equal to q of wi how would this expand out? Basically my first term in the summation would be 1 in which i takes this value p so I will write it as wp plus next term increment i by 1 you get w p plus 1 next term w p plus 2 all the way till w last term q. So how many terms would there be in this kind of a summation? Remember the number of terms will not be q minus p but rather they will be q minus p plus 1. Okay. 
if the lower limit and the upper limit of a summation are the same the way it's being done here the summation will only have a single term and that will be wp okay in this case my lower limit q the value at which i starts is actually greater than the upper limit p therefore this summation will not even start this sum therefore will be equal to zero okay next let's take a look at a few rules of summations if i were to sum a i plus b i where i goes from 1 to n i can actually expand it out very quickly as a 1 plus b 1 that's the first term of my summation when i is equal to 1 plus when i is equal to 2 i get a 2 plus b 2 all the way till a n plus b n okay if i were to gather all the a's together again write them compactly as a single summation then I can write it as the sum, see it's a1 plus a2 all the way till a n. That means the sum of a i where i runs from 1 to n plus I can now gather all the b terms together and write it as a separate summation. That means i goes from 1 to n of b i. Okay? So intuitively speaking therefore in this rule what i have done is that i have kind of opened up the bracket and i have given this summation operator individually to the ai and to the bi see that is what has happened here similarly for this guy i can in one step write it down to be the sum from i is equal to 1 to n of ai minus the sum i is equal to 1 to n of bi okay now this second rule is what we refer to as taking out a constant so here the, the term which is being summed up is a constant that times a i so going from one term to the next the c is not changing the a is changing first term c times a1 second term c times a2 and so on so in this case what we can do is that we can pull the constant out and this becomes c this times the sum from i is equal to 1 to n of a i. Now what if you were summing up a constant? That means you have a constant and you are summing it up let's say n times when i goes from 1 to n. So this will basically expand as c plus c plus c plus c done n times and therefore this summation will very simply be equal to n times c. Now the last rule, it's not really a rule, it's like something that you should be careful about if the term that is being summed up was the sum of two terms ai plus bi we basically ended up giving both the ai and the bi their respective summation operator same was true for difference as well but let's not do that for multiplication that will be wrong okay so the sum of xi multiplied by yi is not equal to the sum of xi multiplied by the sum of yi okay so you in this case cannot give the xi and the yi their respective summation operators okay next let's move on to double summations now to understand double summations let's work with a rectangular array of numbers when i say rectangular array it means that i am working with numbers which have been arranged in rows and columns so in this case i am working with m rows and n columns the way each number has been labeled is to give us very quickly information about where this number is located in terms of its row and column so for example a23 denotes a number which is sitting in the second row that means the first subscript tells me the row and the third column so in general aij i denotes the row and j denotes the column okay so now if i were to ask you to sum up all numbers which are sitting in the first row how would you do that using the summation operator again take a look at each term of the summation and try and find out what's the general template being followed the general template here is that in the subscript the first subscript is a 1 and that is not changing the second subscript is changing from 1 all the way till n 
Therefore, I can write down the sum of all numbers in the first row to be the sum of a 1 j because see 1 is not changing, j is changing where j runs from j is equal to 1 to n. Similarly, all numbers in the second row, their sum will be j goes from 1 to n of a 2j and so on. Okay. Now, if I were to ask you to sum up all numbers or entries in a given column. How would you do that? Take a look at the first column. In the first column, all numbers sitting in this column have the second subscript which is not changing. Second subscript stays as 1. The first subscript is changing from 1 to all the way till m. Therefore, I can write down the sum of all entries in the first column to be the sum of a i 1 where i it goes from 1 to m okay similarly the sum of all entries in the second column what would that be 2 is not changing it's the i which is changing and i i make it run from i is equal to 1 to m okay now if i were to in the next step ask you to sum up these guys this guy plus this guy all the way till the last sum that means the sum of the last row in this case, I am asking you to sum the individual sums. Okay, Let me write down each of these sums to try and figure out what the general template is. Basically, it's like summing up from j is equal to 1 to n of a1j plus the sum of j is equal to 1 to n of a2j all the way till the sum of j is equal to 1 to n of a mj okay so if you were to take a look at each of these terms what is the same every time the summation operator is the same a j is the same see a j every term has a j what is changing in every term is the first subscript so therefore i can write down the general term of my this summation to be j is equal to 1 to n a and then j does not change from one term to the next what is changing is 1 2 3 and so on i can write it as i my variable my dummy variable for this summation then i can run another loop or another summation operator in which i it is made to go from 1 to m okay this is what we refer to as a double summation in this double summation, you have two dummy variables which are being, let's say, looped over j, it's being looped over from 1 to n, i, it's being looped over from 1 to m. When I am actually running the j from 1 to n, let me assume that I am fixing the i at a certain value. So, for example, I start with i is equal to 1, run the j from 1 to n, after I am done with the entire circle of j from 1 to n, I come back and I increment i from 1 to 2 and so on. Okay? If I were to repeat the same exercise by adding up these guys, what would the sum come out to be? The general term of these guys will be sum from i is equal to 1 to m of a i. See, this part is not changing. What is changing is the second subscript. So therefore, I'll write the second subscript in general as j and run an outer loop or an outer summation in which j goes from 1 to n. Okay. Now, either you do this or you do this. Both ways, you will land up with the sum of all numbers in this rectangular array. And therefore, what it tells me is that if you were to, let's say, keep the J summation or the J loop inside or the J loop outside, if you were to take and put the I loop outside or put the I loop inside, the final result will not matter. The order of summation is therefore immaterial. Okay. This, remember, is only true if the limits of these two dummy variables i and j are independent of one another in both cases you can see that i goes from 1 to n j goes from 1 to n what we'll do is that we will do another example which will actually have limits which depend on one another and in that case the 
summations cannot be interchanged okay so this was about double summations let's quickly now end this video by taking a look at properties of products so if i were to let's say write down a product which is a1 times a2 times a3 all the way till a n in a mathematically fancy way i can write it as a giant pi this is like my symbol for product in which the term being multiplied every time is a i and the dummy variable i it runs from 1 to n okay again if i were to pick the lower and upper limit of i to be p and q and write down the product as i is equal to p to q of a i then it will expand out to be a p times a p plus 1 all the way till a q the number of terms in this product remember q minus p plus 1 if all a i's are equal then if i were to write this product as i is equal to 1 to n of a i okay and i am saying that a i's are all equal let all of them be equal to some number a then if you remember in the, in the case of summation the sum from 1 to n of c was actually n c in this case i am saying the product from 1 to n of a will actually be equal to a times a times a done n times and that will be equal to basically a to the power n if i were to run this product from not 1 to n but rather from p to q then it will boil down to a raised to the exponent q minus p plus 1 okay so this was a quick look at the properties of single summation double summation and products